here. Um, and uh, so I'm going to talk about what I call cognitive neuroinformatics. And I'll start with a quote, um, which I think probably describes the experience that a lot of us have in doing science, right? We're drowning in information but starving for knowledge. So the question is, how do we take this mass of information that hits our retinas every day and actually feel like we know something? And it's, you know, I do functional imaging, and it's particularly an issue there where if you look at the number of publications that mention fMRI, it's now somewhere between three and 4,000 a year that are coming out. Um, and um, you would hope that, you know, um, we would feel like we would get some sort of knowledge that would accrue from all of these activation maps, but often you end up sort of feeling like it's just a very techie version of a phrenological map um, without really getting us more towards understanding basic function. Um, so what I want to do today is uh, first kind of ask the question is, how is it that we go about trying to map mental function onto the brain? Because that's sort of my fundamental interest is understanding how does the brain implement mental functions. And then I'll talk about several different projects that we've done that have kind of tried to address this in different ways. First being the Cognitive Atlas Project, which is really building an ontology for cognition. Second is topic mapping, so basically taking that and trying to figure out how can we map it on to, uh, to imaging data, and finally talking about data sharing. So how is it that we map mental function onto the brain? Well, usually we use a, a, an approach that, uh, that Rick Henson first called forward inference, right? which is basically we try to wiggle something in the mind and see what in the brain wiggles when we do that. So we manipulate some mental process like working memory maintenance. I tell you, hold this phone number in your head. Um, and we look at what brain areas turn up in activity when we do that. Um, and then we infer that those brain areas must have something to do with whatever mental process it was that I was wiggling. Um, and so um, we see, for example, that a region like the anterior cingulate shows up when we, uh, turns on when we have people engage in uh, maintenance. Um, but if you look across lots of different studies, you see that lots of different psychological manipulations end up turning on very similar looking patterns of activity, right? So this is patterns of activity. Um, these are actually um, estimated via meta-analysis. So these are actually patterns of activity that are associated with the presence of these particular words in papers. They're not actual activation maps. But if you look at actual studies, you see a very similar story that the same areas light up across many different types of task manipulations. So the question is, what do we make of that? What's, what, what does that tell us? Well, there's a lot of different alternatives, right? One is that there's some confound that drives all of those, such that you know, whenever we engage in any of these tasks, it turns up our autonomic nervous system, and that's causing activity in the anterior cingulate because it monitors the autonomic nervous system. Um, it could be that there's you know, different cortical columns within the anterior cingulate that are doing all these different things, but that they're really distinct, right? And if we had the right resolution, we could see that. It could be that um, the ACC does all those different things, but it does it in different neural contexts. So when it's, when it's communicating with the left posterior parietal, it does one thing. When it's communicating with uh, caudate nucleus, it does another thing. Um, or it could be that we're just chopping up the mind the wrong way, that these are all not really sort of fundamental cognitive functions, but, um, but that, uh, that you know, we're kind of misled about the structure of the mind. And a thought experiment that I like to suggest is, what would have happened if the phrenologist had had functional MRI, right? It's doubtful that they would have decided that phyloprogenitiveness and uh, whatever their other faculties were, that those weren't real, right? They would have found blobs that map onto those things, because presumably all of those, the faculties that the phrenologist had are sort of correlated with real psychological functions, and such. so something would have lit up. And they would have taken that as evidence for the reality of those things, right? Which is pretty clear that that would not be the right, that would not be an appropriate strategy. So, um, so this has kind of led us and others to ask the question of, you know, what is it that, what is this mental stuff that we're actually imaging? And I think many of you may know this book from uh, about 10 years ago now called The New Phrenology. In general, it's kind of a kooky book. Um, because he doesn't really know much about imaging, but, um, but he actually makes some really good points regarding kind of what it is that, how it is that imaging uh, works. And he makes this point that, um, that 
basically, we haven't done a very good job of formalizing, we as cognitive neuroscientists, people who use neuroimaging, haven't done a very good job of formalizing what it is that we're actually mapping onto the brain. So what he calls the butterflies of our mind. We haven't sort of laid out the, the really the ontology of mental processes that we then want to map onto the brain. So if we ask the question, you know, what are the atoms of the mind? What are the fundamental parts of the mind? You know, one answer is this, right? The, the phrenologist gave us an answer that was derived from uh, early faculty psychology that said that things like, um, I can't even read these, like, you know, acquisitiveness and alimentiveness and uh, individuality and mirth are all fundamental psychological functions. Most of us who study the brain now don't really believe that those are the way that we should chop it up. Um, instead, we think it's probably something more like this. We have things like perception and attention and memory, um, and those might have some subparts. Um, and you know, one person might think that they're related in one particular way, but you know, other psychology is not a place where in, anybody agrees on much of anything. So other people might think, for example, that you know, memory is that, for example, working memory is not really part of memory; that it's part of attention. Other people might think that working memory doesn't exist at all. So for any of these concepts, you can pretty easily find somebody who doesn't think it's a real concept, that it's really just a, a kind of an artifact of, of some other function. So the, the first uh, sort of foray into informatics that we made was in trying to develop, trying to sort of make some sense out of this ontological mess and try to develop a formal ontology or at least something down the road towards a formal ontology of psychological function. And so we developed this project called the Cognitive Atlas. It's online at cognitiveatlas.org. It's been up for several years now. Um, and basically, the Cognitive Atlas is, is meant to be a collaborative knowledge building platform. So we know that people in psychology don't agree on anything. We want to be able to not just say, Russ Poldrack and his lab think that the mind is structured this way. We want to be able to say, how does the field think the mind is structured, and be able to capture the disagreement around that. Um, this sort of grew out of, um, out of talking to people who think about, you know, JB mentioned that I was in part uh, affiliated with psychiatry at, at UCLA, and I spent a lot of time talking to people who study psychiatric disorders, and in the end want to know about, you know, what are the genetics of psychiatric disorders? And, the intuition that that world has sort of come up with is that if you want to understand the link between genetics and psychiatric disorders, the way to do that is via what they call endophenotypes, which are basically things that sit in between in the causal pathway between genes and the, those diagnoses of schizophrenia or whatever other disorder you're talking about. And particularly interesting endophenotypes are psychological functions and brain systems. And so we, wanna, we wanted to start thinking about how can we better formalize this relationship. If, if in the end you want to have sort of you know, automated reasoning that can go from genetic association data or knowledge about uh, genetic function all the way up to psychiatric disorders, you have to make all of those links. And the link that we were particularly interested in making was this one between brain systems and psychological functions. And the intuition that we had is that how do we get between those two levels? You know, we can't see psychological functions physically, right? The only thing we can do is poke people's brains using psychological tasks and see what happens in the brain. Um, and so it's that link between cognitive function and brain systems that's kind of mediated by tasks that we really wanted to capture. So here's a, a sort of a schematic of how the the knowledge is laid out in the Cognitive Atlas. We break things into two different types of, of entities. One is what we call mental concepts, and these are kind of uh, conceptual entities, things that are in the head, like working memory or um, pain or you know, sort of any, any kind of psychological concept that people might talk about. Um, then we have mental tasks, which are actually the things that are used to measure those mental concepts. And we came up with a novel relationship that is instantiated in this knowledge base that we call the measured by relationship. And the idea is that any particular cognitive concept, so in this case we might have a concept like response suppression, and we have some ontological relationships between different mental concepts. So for example, we might think response suppression is part of response inhibition. But in the end, this particular thing is defined by its measurement. 
And in this case, it's measured by something we call SSRT, but there could be multiple different things measuring it. The point is that if we want to, in the end, link real data up to these psychological concepts, we have to do that by linking to the, the measurement relation, or by, by defining the measurement relationships that links those concepts to, to in the end, to real data. Um, so let me just show you what a couple of examples look like within the, uh, within the Cognitive Atlas. Um, this is uh, one of the pages, the one for working memory, and you can see that we have a little definition. Um, we have some ontological relationships, so we have, you know, what are the kinds of working memory, what are the parts, uh, what is it a kind or part of, so it's kind of standard ontological relationships. Um, and then if you go down on that page, one thing you see is what are some of the tasks that we think measure working memory? Okay, so we can define tasks, and we actually define, we don't say that working memory is measured by a particular task in general because any particular task has many different measurements that are taken. So it, in general, it's gonna depend on a particular measurement within that task that defines that particular concept. That's these contrast measurements. Then we, have a, we also use some kind of a quick and dirty text mining um, using a, a project called PubBrain that I wasn't going to say much about, but I can say more about it if there's time at the end, which basically mines PubMed abstracts for the presence of particular, basically we have a lexicon of anatomical terms. We mine PubMed abstracts for any particular search term and create a sort of a pseudo-activation map that basically says what parts of the brain are people talking about in the context of that particular search term. So we have one of those maps. We also um, have, we also have links out to Neurosynth, which I'm going to tell you about in a bit. Um, and then we have discussion a la Wikipedia, um, which in the end is meant to kind of allow people to go back and forth and kind of capture some of the, the disagreement that uh, we think is going to exist on some of these. We also have links then to tasks, so we, for any particular task, we define what are the conditions, what are the contrasts, what are the indicators of the things that get measured there. Um, and one of the interesting concepts that my colleague Bob Builder from UCLA came up with is this idea of a task phylogeny. The idea being that you know, many, many psychological tasks derive from other tasks, often going back to you know, the 1920s. Um, so in this case, we could say, for example, you know, that this particular task, the operation span, is a descendant of an earlier task called the digit span. So we can capture kind of the, where tasks come from. Um, and also, again, capture discussion. So what's, what are our goals in this project? Well, we didn't, um, you know, when we first started out, we looked at things like protege and we decided that, that we wanted to build something that was very different in that it would allow scientists to come on and do something interesting quickly. So they could come on and within five minutes they could actually you know, do something useful and interesting. Um, we can't require them to be ontologists because that's just not gonna happen. Um, and so we decided to try to take advantage of what's been learned about social collaborative knowledge building. One of my colleagues, Nikki Couture, is, he's actually worked on analyses of Wikipedia and other kinds of social collaborative knowledge building um, and, and has thought a lot about how we can do that. So we try to sort of place it somewhere, you know, on these two dimensions of ease of use and structure, somewhere in between Wikipedia and something like Protege, where it's, it, you know, it can be used by a non-ontologist, but it, it, it has a little more structure than, uh, than something like uh, Wikipedia would. So we, you know, we, as I said, people don't agree on anything in this field. And so we've tried to build ways to, to we want to involve the community in specifying the, the knowledge. And so far, the community has largely been my lab and a few other labs who've sort of worked together on it. But it's open to anybody to come on and, uh, and contribute. Um, and we also try to capture disagreement. One of the ways we do that is through the discussion page that I showed you earlier. Another is through what we call concept forking, which is sort of like the the um, disambiguation page idea from Wikipedia where if we have a, a term like behavioral inhibition that people really use in multiple different ways, we can say this term has multiple senses. Um, one is the cognitive sense, one is the temperament sense, and then those get treated really as different concepts. So that's one of the ways that we can allow people to sort of disagree is if in the end they really can't agree on what a term means, they can fork it and it can have different senses. Um, we've added some personalization features, so now when you log in, you have a dashboard that can sort of tell you there's interesting stuff that's relevant to what, you're, what you've been working on or relevant to terms that you flagged. You can follow particular concepts. Um, we have a semantic web representation, so we have a Sparkle endpoint. You can, you can grab all of the uh, data via that endpoint as RDF. Um, and 
just in terms of where we are with the project, right now we have about 650 psychological constructs, about uh, 393 tasks, um, and that's, that's pretty much leveled off, and it actually, we, we did a big sort of culling recently where we got rid of a number of them that didn't really make sense. Um, but that's, that's about the, the right number, I think, for where we want to be um, for, the, for the short term, at least. Um, our, we made the decision early on not to build the project around a formal ontology language. We built it using a relational database that gave us a lot of flexibility in the kinds of knowledge we can capture. And then we, what we did was, on the back end, basically shoehorn that into a formal ontology. So we now have an, an OWL version of the knowledge base that's available via BioPortal, or, and we have actually the code that we use to generate it is, is up on GitHub as well. Um, and we, for sort of for, for giggles, our uh, software developers uh, built a, an Android and iOS app. So if you want to know what working memory is when you're walking down the street, you can bring that up on your phone. Um, so we've tried to integrate as much as we can with other projects. So we now um, are included in Neurolex, um, all the, the terms from our, from our ontology. Um, we've worked with the Cognitive Paradigm Ontology, who are working to build sort of more detailed descriptions of cognitive tasks. So we've sort of aligned our information models. I'm going to tell you about Neurosynth. We're deeply sort of uh, engaged with them. And I'll also tell you about OpenFMRI, where we're using this as the platform to describe tasks. OK, so one problem with the Cognitive Atlas in general is right now the database is pretty flat. There's a lot of terms, not a lot of relationships between them, and certainly not a lot of deep relationships. And so we wanted to see if there's any way we could use uh, data mining tools to try to pull some more interesting structure out of the, uh, the published literature and then see if, it sort of, if that structure comports with what we expect out of the brain imaging literature. So the approach that we decided to take was to use what have been come to call generative models of the published literature. So the idea is that for any particular document, you treat that document as a mixture of topics, and every word in the document is, is a sample from, from one of those different topics. So one of the most uh, popular approaches for topic modeling is called latent directly allocation um, from Dave Bly and colleagues. That's the technique that we ended up using. Um, and basically the idea is that you have this set of latent topics, and you have to say how many topics there are, and then those topics generate text, and what you do is you use Bayesian inference to basically infer the topics from the text. So here's the idea that for any particular paper, there might be, so you know, papers in the fMRI world, there's going to be some, pa either one topic is sort of decision making, right? One topic is things having to do with fMRI, one topic is things having to do with basal ganglia. Each of those topics is associated with words that could show up in the document. And so you you start out only having the words across a bunch of documents, and you infer what are those topics. And so this has been used before, for example, in, in, uh, on abstracts from, um, from PNAS. Griffith and Cybers did some early work showing that you can pull out different parts of PNAS abstracts, uh, or different parts of, of the structure of, of PNAS papers by just doing this topic modeling stuff on the abstract. So it's really sensitive to um, different, uh, the use of different terms together. Um, it's actually, an, it, it's an amazingly powerful tool when you start working with it. Um, okay, so how did we do this? So we first, we, we have full text on about 5,800 articles from the fMRI literature. Um, and what we do is we, um, we take all those papers, and first we have to decide how many topics do we use. And we do this by a cross-validation where we split the, um, split the papers into sets, run the topic models at a bunch of different dimensionalities, and then you can, you can actually get from the topic model the um, empirical likelihood of the left out papers. And you, what you do is you basically find the topic dimensionality that maximizes that empirical likelihood of the left out papers. Um, so we started out just doing it on full text. Um, we, we left out a few things that we thought were important. One is just standard English stop words. Um, Two is author names, because we found when, if you do this and you don't leave out author names, most of the topics end up having a couple of people's names in them, and we didn't want that. So basically, we got rid of any name that, um, that showed up on any paper as an author in the, uh, in the database, except if your name is Payne or something like that. That happens to also be a cognitive term. Um, there is someone whose last name is P-A-I-N. Um, and then we also left out brain structures. Um, because we didn't want the topic modeling to be driven by 
sort of the brain structures that were popping up. We really wanted to be sensitive to the conceptual stuff around cognitive processes. So here's what some of the topics look like. And so the topics are, are not ordered, right? We, there's 130 top, or sorry, 160 topics. These are just a few examples. Um, and the idea is that each of these are sets of words that define a particular topic that, that different ones of these papers are about. Um, and so you can see that it finds some that are just about very general stuff like that you would say in writing any paper, right? Figure, abstract, those kind of things. Um, study analysis. This is one of my favorites, um, which is basically spellings that British people use. Um, so, uh, but you also see you can get some very, very detailed ones. Here's one about Alzheimer's disease, MCI, one about aging, here's one about sort of gambling, neuroeconomics, one about memory. So it does a pretty good job of picking out sets of words that seem to be, you know, we can all look at these and say, oh yeah, that's a sensible topic, right? That's about X. Um, but there's a lot of stuff here that, that isn't really cognitive, right? And we were really interested more in getting at the cognitive structure. So we took a next step, which was to basically um, only use the terms from the cognitive atlas. So basically we take the, the words and phrases that are in cognitive atlas and we model the phrases just as like a single token and then we throw out all the other words. So we have, in this case, when we did it, uh, we had 545 terms in the atlas. Um, and here we get about 130, or we get 130 topics. Um, that's our dimensionality. And so here's some examples. So now we get topics that are much more focused on cognitive stuff, right? Because that's the only terms we've let in. And the underscores here just mean that that's a, that's a compound term from the atlas. So you, um, I've sort of focused on memory here, right? You get three different memory topics that are all about different aspects. Here's one about working memory, one about episodic memory, one about semantic memory. Here's one about response inhibition, one about cognitive control. And you can see that each of them maps across a decent number of documents in the corpus, but certainly not all the documents, right? It's relatively, you know, usually less than 10% of the documents um, load on any particular cognitive topic. Okay, so this tells us that there's interesting structure that we can pull out using these topic modeling tools. Now we want to ask, does, can we map this back onto brain activity? Um, and uh, we don't have the raw imaging data for each article, right? But um, it turns out, as you know, that brain activity is usually reported in a somewhat standardized uh, format in these sort of tables in papers where it's in this XYZ MNI or Talarac uh, coordinate system. And um, the, the 5,800 papers that we have are chosen for a particular reason, which is that Taliarconi was able to develop a tool called automated coordinate extraction that can actually pull out the activation coordinates from all of those papers. And um, uh, in a paper in Nature Methods last year, we showed that, um, that we had, if you compare it to David Van Essen's SumsDB manually annotated database, we get pretty good precision and pretty good recall um, against that database. So we seem to be doing a pretty good job of actually getting these coordinates accurately. Um, and so what we can do is, you know, for each of those papers, we have the full text and we have the, the activation coordinates. Um, and in, first I'm gonna sort of try to convince you that this automated coordinate extraction thing actually works. So we can create meta-analytic maps that, for example, this is just using single terms yet, so we're not up to using um, the, the topics. But this is um, looking at the association of activity at each voxel in the brain with the present, with the, the sort of over presence of a particular term. So I forget what the threshold is, but this is basically when I say that the paper is overrepresented in the term visual, it means that it occurs more often in that paper than it does in most other papers. And uh, you see that you get the regions that you would expect for visual, auditory, and sensory maps. Um, it also works in sort of more complex stuff. So for sort of working memory, executive control, you see kind of as you expect overlapping maps for lots of these different concepts. Um, here's maps for language, and again you see this sort of left hemisphere activation that you would expect. Um, and uh, finally, emotion, reward, social processing. Again, just making the point that 
we can, this is just looking for the words in the paper now, single words in the paper, we can do a pretty good job of pulling out kind of, you know, what we already know about, uh, about the localization of those particular functions. A more, a more interesting question is whether you can actually classify whether a paper is going to overrepresent a particular word based on its, um, its activation pattern. So JB mentioned the reverse inference question that I've sort of been talking about for quite a while. This is one way to try to get at that. How well can you tell what a paper is about given the, the brain activation? Um, and so in this work, um, we used a, a naive Bayes classifier and asked at a couple of different levels, you know, can we predict, for example, whether a paper is about working memory or emotion or pain, where about means that it overrepresents that particular term. Um, and um, we did cross-validation, and, and in this case, we did it across 25 high-frequency terms. Um, and so first, I'll show you the pairwise classification data, which is basically, can we decide whether a paper is about one or the other of these things, and then we actually move to multi-class. So here's the pairwise data, and basically if it's green, that means that we can do an okay job of classification. We're in sort of the 70% range, well above chance. Um, the blue ones are the ones where we're not doing very well. So for example, let's see, that's um, imagery and uh, attention are, are sort of pretty hard to pull apart. Um, and so um, what this starts to maybe tell us is that some of these concepts that are hard to pull apart might not really be, um, either they're being used in, in sort of imprecise multiple ways in the literature or they're really not different concepts. I'll come back to that. Um, this is what we get if we try to do multi-class classification across many different terms. And again, the, the accuracy is, is not great, but it's well above chance. The, the sort of dotted line down here is chance. This is our accuracy up to uh, classifying which of 10 different terms is going to be present. So it tells you that despite the incredible sparsity of that sort of you know, three-dimensional three MNI space representation, you can actually do a pretty good job of pulling out uh, the maps that can drive this kind of classification. All right, so now what, what can we do in terms of the topics that we've pulled out? So I've shown you that it works for individual words. How does it work for topics? So, um, so I mentioned that you know, for every document, we know it's loading on each topic. And uh, each document loads on about 6.5 topics on average. Um, so we have the, the activation coordinates for all those papers. Um, and then at every voxel, we do a chi-square test to basically say, is the activation of that voxel across papers associated with the loading on that topic across papers? And, we, um, and then we do a whole ring correction for each of those. Um, and so we can get an association map between a particular topic and activation. So here's an example. This is showing threshold correlation, thresholded correlations. So everything that shows up here is FDR corrected for this whole brain. Um, blue means negative correlation, red means positive correlation. This is the map for memory, working memory, maintenance, visual working memory. Um, and all, all the maps I'm going to show you, the, the upshot of them is, yeah, they kind of make sense. It's actually a challenge to know where we go beyond kind of saying, yeah, this already tells us what we already know. Um, and that's a, I think that's an interesting point for discussion. But, um, but certainly we see very clearly that this is able to pull out probably in an even cleaner way than the single word uh, analysis. So for example, here's episodic memory, recall, verbal memory, and you get you know, nice bilateral medial temporal lobe and uh, retrosplenial cortex. Um, here's our semantic memory one where you get this uh, left is right here. So you get all this left prefrontal temporal stuff. Um, here's that response inhibition one where you get the right prefrontal stuff that you expect along with basal ganglia. Um, here's the cognitive control one. Again, you get prefrontal sorts of things that one expects from the cognitive control literature. Um, there's a motor one, so you get exactly what you would expect, motor cortex. Um, and you can see that there's also some that, so here's, for example, one that loaded on a relative, sorry, this is the number of papers it loads on. The previous ones were all loading on, you know, several hundred papers. This one loads on a relatively small, about 1% of the papers, is that, uh, yeah, about 1% of the papers in the, in the corpus. And it's about regret, surprise, reasoning, arousal. And you find this sort of fairly focused stuff down in the amygdala. Um, so it says that it can actually find relatively subtle things in the literature that you wouldn't necessarily see if you were just, you know, there, there probably are not enough papers that use the term regret 
to actually find uh, you know, a robust map if you just look for that term. But using the topic mapping, because we can sort of integrate across terms, we may be able to get more power to actually find that. So we next wanted to ask whether we can use this to find out something about mental disorders. Um, so remember that uh, you know, I mentioned the idea of the endophenotype, the, the idea that we want to be able to sort of figure out what's sitting in between you know, the disorder and the, and the genes. Um, and so we started by basically doing the same thing that we had done with the cognitive atlas terms, but now we do with the disorder terms. So we took a set of, we basically came up with our own lexicon based on NIF standard and on DSM, which sort of spans across both uh, neurological and psychiatric disorders. Um, we, that gave us 56 disorder terms, and there, here we had to do some synonym mapping because there's a lot of different ways that people can use all of those terms. So we mapped them all into this set of 56 items. Um, and uh, here again, you get things that make a lot of sense. So here's one for amnesia and Alzheimer's disease and Korsakoff syndrome and Wernicke's, and you get primarily bilateral medial temporal lobe. And interestingly, all of this kind of lateral and, and medial parietal stuff, which I, I think might actually tell us something interesting. As, you know, hopefully it's clear that one of the challenges for us is really figuring out what's a discovery and what's noise out of this stuff. And, and I'm actually really interested to hear if people have ideas about how to address that challenge. Um, here's one for gambling, drug abuse, impulse control disorder, and you get basal ganglia and uh, ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Here's one for dyslexia, specific language impairment, and you get these left hemisphere regions that are usually associated with that. Um, and here's a final one for anxiety disorder, panic disorder. Again, you get bilateral amygdala. Um, so again, we can, we can pull out uh, pretty robustly the maps of regions that we know to be associated with these terms. We can also ask about kind of the higher order structure. Um, there's a lot of interest these days in sort of how are different psychiatric disorders related to one another with the idea that they might be actually describing sort of underlying dimensions rather than, so for example, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, many people think are not really separate disorders, that they're kind of falling on some sort of, uh, on a couple of different dimensions. Um, so what we did was we took those topic maps for each of the different topics and clustered them in, in brain space to basically say, how, using hierarchical clustering, how do the, um, the sort of neural representations of those different topics relate to one another. And interestingly, you get several clusters that make a lot of sense. Obviously, this is arbitrary in terms of where I put my, uh, my, my tree cut here, but it, it was a pretty obvious uh, place to put it. Over here, and sorry about all these, these crazy acronyms, but basically, these are, this is aphasia and dyslexia. So these are our two language disorders off on their own over here. These are uh, amnesia, Alzheimer's disease, and then several autism things. So those are kind of off on their own over here. These are all the sort of schizophrenia, ADD, conduct disorder, basically ex what are called externalizing disorders in the literature. And then these are all of your depression, anxiety, gambling, phobia, eating, things like that, what are called, largely what are called internalizing disorders. So it shows that not only can we pick out kind of, you know, individual mappings of brain systems to, um, to particular disorders, but we can pick out the larger clusters of those things based solely on the brain maps that come out of this, uh, this meta-analysis. Um, so in the last question we wanted to ask, can we actually discover anything new? Can we discover any new endophenotypes? Um, so that would be groupings of disorders and cognitive processes that group together via sort of common representation in these brain maps. And to do this, we use the sparse canonical correlation analysis where we basically come up with, you know, weightings across mental functions and disorders that basically end up projecting into a common brain space. And, uh, you know, again here we find some things that sort of make sense. So for example, and sorry about the tiny text, but we found a bunch of stuff related to you know, mood dis induction, reward, reward anticipation, and anxiety disorder, depression, gambling, obesity. Here's another one about emotion, valence, and it maps to amnesia, schizophrenia, autism. So you start getting kind of clusterings across disorders. Now this is really a case where it's hard to know what's discovery and what's noise. Um, and so we, um, you know, we, we haven't pushed this part of it very hard yet. 
And I think it's, uh, it, it's going to be interesting to see kind of where we can go with it. If we can actually drive some new hypotheses, for example, that one might be able to find relationships between particular disorders it, based on particular brain systems um, using this sort of approach. Okay, so, so let's say that, you know, we, so clearly the, the topic mapping stuff gives us some information about the structure in the, you know, in the literature and, um, and uh, kind of what, how these terms relate to one another, but it doesn't give us sort of strong enough structure that we want to really start building ontological links. So we're still going to need people, we're still going to need domain experts, obviously, to come in and do the annotation on, on the ontology, on the cognitive atlas. But let's say that, you know, in, in, at some point in the future, we actually have such, a, uh, such an ontology built. Um, one idea, then what, what can we do with it, right? We, wanna, we, we would hope that it's actually useful. And, and the reason that I, as a scientist, got involved in this, the intuition that I have is that once we have these ontologies, we can use them to actually tell us which parts are right and which parts are wrong. So my intuition about you know, all of this psychological stuff is that a lot of it, you know, a lot of it hasn't really changed since William James wrote his 1890 Principles of Psychology and, um, and probably has to be incorrect. Right? A lot of it is what we call folk psychology, is kind of how we intuit our minds to be structured, which may well not be a, a very good um, uh, way to actually figure out how the mind works. Um, so what we want to do is ask, you know, once we have the ontology, ask, are there, are there parts of the ontology that seem to comport with how the brain breaks things up? Are there other parts that don't? So one way that we're thinking about doing that, and we haven't actually, we don't have the data to do this yet, but it's kind of a, a promissory note on how we can think about doing this in the future, is thinking about this in terms of meta-analytic testing of cognitive theory. So let's say, in this case, I'm just going to talk about behavioral data. So let's say I have four behavioral measures on different tasks. And, one, and I have an ontology that says, well, these two particular measures rely on a concept called inhibition, and these two particular measures rely on a concept called updating. Right? But somebody else, and, and sorry, and, and those, that um, claim about the ontology has a particular implication regarding the covariance structure amongst those data, right? It suggests that these things that rely on the same concept should be more correlated with one another than they should be with things that rely on the other concept. So that's our little covariant, predicted covariance matrix up there. Somebody else would claim that, oh, they're all just uh, uh, related to some very general thing called executive function that can't be broken up. And that predicts another covariance matrix that's different. So if we have data across all these measures, we, we have observed covariance, we can actually use techniques like meta-analytic structural equation modeling to ask which of those actually fits better with the observed data. Right? So then we can start to, to basically say, how do, um, how do particular ontological claims fit with the data? And that's part of why we want to be able to capture multiple different senses of, or multiple kinds of ontological claims within the cognitive atlas. So we want to do this with real data. Um, and our intuition is that the data that we get from Neurosynth probably is not sufficient to do that, um, in part because I think that just you know, finding terms in the text is not a strong enough method of annotation that we really need um, something that's, that's probably more human-centered, um, or at least something that's human-verified, um, such that we have annotations linking the ontology to, each of, to any document that we're looking at. Um, the second thing is we need a really broad range of tasks that tap, so we basically need, we, can't really, we don't want correlations between what particular task is being used and what particular concept is being measured. Each concept needs to be measured by multiple tasks. Um, and we need to have voxel-wise data. So instead of the, the coordinate-based data that, that I've shown you, we really need data at the voxel level because many of these things, they might not be distinct at the kind of very broad level, but they might be distinct at the level of, pat, of finer grain patterns of activity. Um, that's become clear in the literature. And so in thinking about this, um, we got excited about trying to, um, to actually implement data sharing for fMRI. And most of you probably know the history of data sharing for fMRI, which started 
uh, back around 2000 with the fMRI data center, um, which generated a lot of uh, controversy and in the end um, ended up sharing about 100 data sets, um, but uh, stopped accepting data about seven years ago and has not shared any new data in, in quite a while and as far as I know doesn't plan to share any new data. So, um, so sensing the need for open data sharing, um, we developed this project called the Open fMRI Project. It's at openfmri.org. Um, it basically started with me when I moved from UCLA to UT just saying, I'm going to take all the data. We have to anonymize them anyway to move from UCLA to UT. We're going to take all these data and make them available online openly um, for, for download. Um, and um, we've, we've tried to come up with structures such that they can be easily analyzed. We've come up with a very f uh, tight format that all the data sets are formatted by. So once you know that format, you can easily just go analyze any of them. Um, and there actually exists a, a NiPipe workflow to, to do that full analysis that, that Satra created. Um, we right now have 14 data sets with about 250 subjects, um, and we have more coming in. We got a grant from the National Science Foundation that supports us to sort of run the site and put our own data in, and also supports a number of other sites with a part-time data manager whose job is to basically take data from that lab and feed it into this, uh, to this project. And we've also had volunteers from other sites um, who've, uh, who've given us data as well, um, and we're hoping that that will increase. Um, one thing that we do is we integrate the description of the tasks in OpenFMRI with the Cognitive Atlas project. So this is the OpenFMRI page for a particular data set, this rhyme judgment data set. And you see that it says there's one particular task here with two conditions. And when you click on that, it links out to 